That was the sounds of sirens from the security detail escorting state witness Jonathan Dowdall into the CCJ in Dublin this morning. Mr Dowdall spent his second day in the witness stand where he has been giving evidence against Jerry the Monk Hutch. I'm Michael O'Toole, crime correspondent with The Star and welcome to another episode of our podcast focusing on the trial of Mr Hutch. Now before we get started, just to recap, Mr Hutch is on trial at the non-jury special criminal court in the CCJ. He is charged with murdering David Byrne at the Regency Airport Hotel in North Central Dublin on the 5th of February 2016. That's a charge he denies. Two men are on trial alongside Mr Hutch. Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy are not charged with the murder of David Byrne however. Instead they are accused of helping a crime gang carry out the murder by providing it with cars. Like Mr Hutch they deny the charge and all three are now on trial. Joining me now to discuss yet another interesting day in the trial is the Star's chief reporter Paul Healy. Hello Paul. How's it going Mick? Yeah, another eventful day to say the least. It's 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 very stressful but it's it's invigorating being there at the same time. Oh yeah, I mean look, I mean this this is the meat and bones as I said of the entire case. Uh we we were getting the tail end today basically of the prosecution's uh, questions to Jonathan Dowdall, so that's prosecuting counsel Sean Gillan, uh, and he was going to play portions of the tapes uh, to Jonathan Dowdall this morning. So that's where we started off um, in relation to the case. So I think it'd be good to to maybe talk through a little bit of the atmosphere and the things that happened at the start of this case um, today, as we we, we kind of did that yesterday. And I think that kind of worked out sort of well. Yeah, and just to... And just to recap, I suppose the main point that I took away from yesterday was that Jonathan Dowdell claimed in his direct evidence that uh, Mr. Hutch, who denies the, the murder, uh, told him that he and a man called James Michael Gately shot David Byrne at the Regency Airport Hotel. That really is the top line. So that was most of his direct evidence. Today was the remainder of the direct evidence. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> you know, every day you go in here, you're wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, we sat down, things were about to proceed. Uh, and then there was talk of um, poor Jerry Hutch. He he can't see uh, Jonathan Dowdall. Um, we know he's wearing a headset, so he's you know he's had difficulty hearing. It's hard enough for us to hear Jonathan Dowdall yesterday. To be honest, very hard. Um, oh, does uh, he speak? In it? Does he speak very low? He speaks very low, but he also speaks away from the microphone, and he had to continue to be reminded to speak into the microphone. I mean, look, he's talking. A normal volume it's just that it's a big you know it's a room and then you've got these big glass uh uh panels that are up i presume for you know from the time of covid i mean that's not the case in every courtroom but in this courtroom there's glass um barriers kind of in the way and that seems to be maybe kind of muting the sound a little bit so there was talk of this can we you know they're in the way, uh, and 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 uh, and Mister Hutch has moved uh, from his position in the dock. He was in the the, the far um, so from my left, so the far right hand corner of the dock, the, the closest to the judges, uh, next to uh, Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy the entire time. Uh, but he'd moved to the complete opposite end to get a clear view of Jonathan Dowd. So I thought that was fascinating because he wanted to look Jonathan Dowd all right in the eye. As I said, he was staring at him yesterday. Uh, but, you know, he was obscured somewhat by this glass panel. So this time he was sitting out kind of a bit uh, so that he could kind of look directly at Jonathan Dowdall. But again today, Jonathan Dowdall didn't look at Jerry Hutch. I think someone said to me, he glanced at him once when he walked out. But uh, I, Jonathan Dowdall keeps his head down the entire time. And today, uh, portions of the clips uh, of the tapes um, of this bugged conversation between Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdall were played to Jonathan Dowdall. And again, he kept his head down through the whole thing, not looking at anyone actually now, just face down, listening to it, looking a little stressed, to be honest. Um, Jerry Hutch, however, like, I mean, at times, as I said, he was staring at uh, Jonathan Dowdall, but he was, if I can kind of describe this, um, especially later in the cross-examination, Jerry Hutch kind of had his his head on his hands and he was leaning forward. Um, and I just eyes fixed right on Jonathan Dowdall the entire time and everything he was saying uh, he was reacting to uh, very much you could see in his facial expressions um, and I'm just thinking of the geography of the court so effectively Jonathan Dowdall is although it's about maybe 25 feet away he, is he, he's facing effectively facing Mr Dowdall so they're, they're, or, uh, they're Jerry Hutch and Dowdall 
They're from face a, off, facing off to each other. Facing I mean, they're directly off opposite from each opposite other, really. side of the rooms. Yeah. So, I mean, if the, this issue of, oh, the glass paneling is going to be removed. And you know, the, apparently there was somebody that had showed up, but they went to the wrong court. So there's a whole hullabaloo about that. But eventually those glass panels got removed later in the day. Um, but today, as I said, this morning's evidence was in relation to playing Jonathan Dowd all those clips. I don't propose to talk about this in too much detail other than to speak about the highlights because we've gone through these clips and what's been said on them and you know Mick from listening to these clips uh this tape both men are speaking very quickly but Jonathan Dowdall says about like you know 45 words in, in, in a second uh he really speaks very quickly and then you're watching a transcript on a screen in front of you of the conversation but even that isn't particularly helpful because it's moving really quickly so I was trying to type all of this up and I just stopped myself I, I must admit, I, I thought that the, we knew that the transcript would be put on the screens. They're too big. Yeah, I don't know, 50 inch TV screens or whatever. Uh, and when I heard that before the, evidence, the the bugged conversation between Hutch and Dowdle was played initially, I was a bit relieved because I thought, right, that'll make things easier. I thought it made it harder because, you know, you were keeping one eye on the, the transcript. You could see what was about to be said and you were starting to type it up and then you heard the actual voices. So it, it melted my head. So, yeah, I, 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 I feel what you were. Yeah, it, it, was, it was horrendous. But anyway, look, that's journalists giving out. So he was he was played certain clips today. Yeah, and I propose to kind of take this in a way that I had done it when I was in uh, the case, when I was live tweeting it. I just decided, when I say live tweeting, um, I had to stop myself, type up a certain amount of what was said, and basically then I went back upon that and put up what I was confident of what, what was said. But for every second that you stop to type something, you're missing something else. So it's very important to say yeah. how, quick, how quickly this all kind of proceeds. Um, but yeah, just in getting into those clips, uh, there were a couple of revelations, so to speak, that came from this. Um, you know, there's conver- there's conversations in these tapes, you know, about him helping the Hutches and get his his getting involved. You know, the context of this is they went up, they were going up north, and they were going to talk to individuals up north uh, to somehow broker some sort of a peace, a ceasefire in the feud. And Jonathan Dowdall knew individuals or allegedly knew individuals that could help assist in that. So he was asked by Sean Galan, you know, just in relation to his involvement with the Hutches and that and why he got involved. Uh, Jonathan Dowdall said he got involved because he believed he had been told at that point in time by Patsy Hutch that the Kinnahans wrongly believed uh, that Gary Hutch was an informant and that they were blaming Gary and they were blaming Patrick Hutch for trying to kill Daniel Kinnahan. And there was talk of uh, a sum of 4.5 million euro uh, that was in an apartment that Gary Hutch was living in in Spain and that they wanted to take this money, kill Daniel Kinahan, um, you know, and that very interesting that sum of money I don't think has ever been discussed, a sum of 4.5 million euro, has it, Mick? No, I, 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 I heard re- fleeting references to that and I actually... Uh, I, I was quite, uh, I was very interested to hear that because I'd never heard that amount of money. The only reference I'd heard to money about Gary Hutch was, you know, a 2008, I think. There was a big robbery in, in Dublin uh, and Gary Hutch was allegedly involved in that. It was, it was a, a bank robbery, a tiger kidnapping. And the story was that Hutch, Jerry, Gary Hutch, gave his share of that robbery to Daniel Kinnan because the Kinnans, as we said, they're 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 not only drug kingpins, but they're very good at laundering money, and they know you know how to make even more money. And the story, one of the stories was that you know he didn't get the money back from Daniel Kinnan, and that started the whole thing. But you know, you know the point. I I think what a really really important point here is, I think there's only two people who know exactly what happened because you've heard the story about uh, Gary Hutch being an informer. I was told briefed, ah, uh, you know, this was really about Gary Hutch wanting to take over the Kinnan drugs gang now i've heard this about the 4.5 million so there's lots of stories but really the only people i think who know are gary hutch and daniel kinnan and, I, and gary hutch can't talk about it and daniel kinnan probably won't ever talk about it but yes you, you're yeah uh, that was interesting but it's interesting even you know that jonathan dowdall was explaining why he was helping the hutches and now he has this i suppose new version of events new story that he says he only learned when he went into weedfield prison he calls it the "Quote unquote," real reason why the Kinahan Hutch feud started, um, and you know, as a result of that, I suppose he changed his feelings on his involvement. He said that Gerard didn't start it; uh, that it was Patsy's sons that started the feud. It wasn't the Kinahans, was the quote. Uh, we actually led with that online, um, and we was one of our top lines in leading with it earlier because that 
is an incredible statement by Jonathan Dowdo that he's saying the Kinnahans didn't start the feud. Well, that probably does go back to the, and I want to thank one of our eagle-eyed listeners. I, I said the, the murder attempt on Daniel Kinnahan uh, in which innocent boxer Jamie Miro was shot was in August 2013. It was actually August 2014. So thanks to our, our listener for that. So maybe that, that, is that what that's a reference to? The kind of, that, you know, uh, Gary Hutch starting it by trying to kill Daniel Kennan effectively. Yeah, that's what's a reference to. And as Jonathan Dowdo had said, he subsequently learned that that was the shooting of Jamie Moore, the boxer Jamie Moore, um, who has went on to talk about uh, his experience about being shot. Um but just moving on from that, then a couple of the other things that came out in relation to the tapes. You know yourself, Mick. Doubt all rants, and he goes on and on and on. And there's a lot of conversation. And um, it, I was wondering, were they going to go through all of this with a, time, a fine tooth comb? But really, uh, the prosecution counsel, Sean Glan, wanted to just pick up on one or two sentences out of a clip of about a dozen or more. And his specific interest was in relation to the constant references to the three yokes, as they were called in the tapes. Uh, We've heard that it was the prosecution's case that the three yokes are the three AK-47 rifles that were uh, found in the boot of Shane Ron's car and later identified as being the same weapons, the Kalashnikovs that were used in the Regency attack. Um, But we haven't heard anybody say that other than John Galan at this point. So he put it to Jonathan Dowdell. When you say three yokes, what were you referring to? And he said the three guns. What three guns? He said the three AK-47s. So that was important for the prosecution's case, certainly, to have Jonathan Dowdell acknowledge and confirm that when he's talking about yokes with Jerry Hutch, he's referring to those guns. And then there's another meeting. The meeting that they went up north, we heard more about this later on, Uh, They met with Republican figures and Jerry Hutch had a discussion uh, where Jonathan Dowdall says he left the room for a period of 20 minutes. But asking Jerry Hutch about that later, he said that that Mr. Hutch told him the conversation was about handing the AK-47 rifles over to these men. Um, It's the key to that is Dowdall says he wasn't in the room for 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 that. So, I mean, you hear on the tapes of conversation uh, where Dowdall is kind of trying to find out what did Jerry Hutch say to these men. And Dowdall explained that he was trying to find out, basically, did Jerry Hutch tell these guys about his involvement, about the fact that it was them, the Hutches, uh, and specifically him, that were involved in the Regency Hotel attack or not. Uh, and Dowdall says he didn't find that out from from Jerry Hutch. So it's fascinating because, you know, Dowdall is admitting that he was inquisitive and he wanted to know what happened in this meeting between Jerry Hutch and these Republican figures. He says he didn't get the answer on that. And what I, what I found interesting, I have a wee amateur theory that this whole trial will probably come down to that word yokes. So the way it works, in the, in it, because it's a non-jury trial, it's the, the three judges, Miss Justice Tara Burns and two other judges who are the presiding, the Miss Justice Tara Burns is the presiding judge, and she, they will make findings and decisions based on the evidence. So essentially, I mean, I've spoken to people about this. I don't know what what you think about this. You know, is it, I think it is, if the judges find that Yokes was a reference to the Kalashnikov style rifles that were used in the the Regency Airport Hotel attack, then Mr. Hodge is in serious bother. Yeah, I think he's in serious bother if that is the finding of the judges. Um, But, you know, the We're not preempting any finding. No. (laughs) Important to say that. The prosecution's case... mm -hmm. They said themselves is that Jerry Hutch is one was one of the team involved in the Regency Hotel attack, and to be a member of that team, you know there's all there was involvement in relation to the moving of these rifles, and Jerry Hutch is alleged to have been in a position where these rifles were handed over, um, and there's an involvement in relation to that, and then the conversation about the Oaks, etc. So all of that is going to come into play, and that's why it's very important for them to have asked Jonathan Dowdle, uh, when you say Yokes, uh, what do you mean? And he said the guns. Uh, so much. I think they call through. that grounding. I, yeah. I think legal experts call that grounding. It's you know you're saying the basics basically. So so what happened after that? Because that you're right. That was that was a key point. Yeah. So also the prosecution wanted to know uh, what was Jonathan Dowdell referring to in the tapes when the two men discussed the village, and Jonathan Dowdell confirmed that it was Buckingham Village. Discussed Buckingham Village already. Uh, in that that was the alleged meet-up spot of the the uh, vehicles involved in the hit and the individuals who were involved met in, in Buckingham Village. Um, so that, again, is important in terms of, of grounding the prosecution's case. But there was interesting talk um, 
in relation to Patsy Hutch, uh, it, 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 Jonathan Dowdall divulged uh, today in court um, that that Patsy Hutch was was worried uh, about CCTV footage from Buckingham Village, but he had allegedly told Jonathan Dowdall that that footage had been gotten rid of because he quote unquote drove the van. So this is the first time we've heard an allegation from anyone's mouth that Patsy Hutch drove the van uh, in relation to the uh, the incident at the Regency Hotel. There are so many, uh, just to interrupt Paul for a second, there are so many really major lines from a journalistic perspective. Now this is evidence, so that's grand. But it's like, it's like you're, you're sort of punch drunk. It's like, Jesus, here's another one coming. It must have had, you must have had that sensation, not more. Yeah, and for every line you catch, you miss another one. Um, just in relation to the... Uh, the tapes then I really want to move on to the cross-examination because there's so much but just another key element to the, the prosecution asking uh, Mr. Dowdall to contextualise the tapes uh, there is a clip in which uh, Mr. Hutch and uh, Jonathan Dowdall talk about the papers coverage and about some of the things that were said uh, Jerry Hutch says the papers weren't too far wrong in some of their coverage Um and they spoke about the half a dozen hitmen or a half a dozen hitmen and that um individuals that they had spoken to were going to do away with these six hitmen. So Jonathan Dowdall was asked to explain this um, and uh, he said look there was uh, there was never anything spoke about or agreed to um, the, the, these men that they had talked to they were never going to do anything like that to, you know because there's a suggestion that these men were going to go and try to kill uh, these individuals and um, he said oh, there was no suggestion of that um, he said the only discussion that they had with these individuals that they, that they were going to try and stop the feud for them um and he described what was happening in these tapes as loose talk there wasn't really any substance in it he said um but just so, the, the six yeah, individuals uh, sorry um th- 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 it, and my, if i'm right my understanding is it, it was said there that those six individuals were the gang the kennehan gang that murdered yeah uh, nettie hutch eddie hutch jerry hutch's brother uh, yeah. who was uh, murdered three days after the regency yeah, Sean Galan asked, who are these six people you're referring to? Uh, and, and he said that they were the men that they believed had murdered uh, Nettie Hutch. Excuse me. Uh, you know, a brother of the accused. And, and three uh, that, that murder occurred three days after the Regency. Uh, he also said these six people tried to kill Jared, And that they'd been threatening people and stuff like that. Uh, you know, so we heard that portion on the tape previously that these had to go. And those words came from Jerry Hutch that these individuals would have to go and that that would form part of the basis for any kind of ceasefire or end to the feud. But Jonathan Dowdall's here now saying, no, I was all just loose talk. I, I also, I, I'm, I'm remember, I was in that day and I remember that uh, Jerry Hutch also said, you know, but by the same token, the people who murdered David Byrne would have to go as well. So it was sort of yes. like a quid pro quo. Yes, and, and speaking about six persons, Jonathan Dell was also asked about the six persons believed to be involved in the Regency attack uh, and who he believes that those individuals may be. Um, and Jonathan Dowdall said uh, that he believed that Jerry Hutch was one of them. Jared, I knew, was involved because he told me, he said. Uh, we know uh, this allegation will come to it later about the, the, the park meetup and where Jerry Hutch allegedly confessed to Jonathan Dowdall. So that's what he's referring to here. He said, then I knew about Kevin Murray because I was told who he was. Um, and he, he said he knew about Patrick uh, because of photographs that he'd seen. Um, so he's naming various individuals who he's saying were allegedly involved in the Regency. I mean, that's just, as I said, there's uh, two individuals there that are not before the courts. And it's important to state that. But here he is uh, name dropping uh, people again. Yeah, and he, he did mention... Also, someone who's not before the courts, Mago Gately, uh, he said that uh, he said that Jerry Hutch told him that he and Mago Gately were involved in the killing. Previously, he did, yeah. And and key to this as well, because this was a portion of the tapes where Jerry Hutch says that the individuals involved in the Regency didn't know each other. And today, Jonathan Dowdall plainly said that Jerry Hutch was lying in this portion of the tape. He did know, they did all know each other. He said their family members and friends, they all knew each other. So, so I mean, that's his analysis of what Jerry had said. That now that is direct evidence, I suppose, from the yes. recordings. But that's his analysis, and that's what his claim or belief is about what Jerry Hutch said in that, because he did say in the recordings, the the the, the, the six don't know each other, or don't know who who the whole group is, basically. 
He did. And it's important to state that this is Jonathan Dowdall um, t- telling his version of events. It's not us saying it. It's not uh, saying that this is fact. That's for the judges to determine. Um, you know, and this is something that came up in cross-examination later. Jonathan Dowdall's story and version of events has changed and evolved over time. But he had his reasons or his explanations for why that was. You know, he's got, he was accused of lying. But he had an explanation for every time that he did uh, kind of change his story because he said his understanding of certain things had changed. You know, he was everything or 99% of what he'd been told, and this was brought up by Brendan Gretton later, later, was from Patsy Hutch. He had this great relationship and friendship and trust, supposedly, with Patsy Hutch to the point where Patsy Hutch went to John Dowdall, of all people, for some reason, to ask him to try and mediate and stop the feud. Uh, you have to take Jonathan Dowdall's word at that, um, but that that's what he's claiming. Um, so I propose to get into, because I think this was just extraordinary this afternoon in uh, the cross-examination of Jonathan Dowdall by Brendan Graham. Just just before we go on, uh, I like this bit sort of, uh, he finished his direct evidence. Brent, yes. uh, uh, Sean Glan sat down. So Brendan Graham, senior counsel for Jared Hutch, stood up. What was it like in the room when it happened? I think we've all been anticipating this because, I mean, we've got a teaser, I suppose, to a degree as to what Brendan Gretton is going to say. And, you know, John Dendell makes a lot of claims. And as I said, his story changes a lot of times. So we anticipated that he was going to say he was going to really challenge him. And I mean, as I said, John Dendell has kept his head down the whole time and he's kept very much um, to script, so to speak. Like he's he was being led in a particular direction by the prosecution because they wanted to lead him to certain points that they want to bring up, which is their case against Jerry Hutch. But but really, this is where he's going to be challenged on everything he said. So as I, I was fascinated just to see the body language of, of Jonathan Dowdall once this kind of cross-examination started. And just when, he, when, he, when, he, when it was about to start, did he look as if, oh, here I go, I'm in trouble? Or was he calm or was he unfazed or what? I think he was calm initially. Uh, over time, I thought he was quite animated. We, I mean, he kind of came out of his shell a little bit. As I said, we couldn't hear Jonathan Dowdall for a lot of the time. We could certainly hear him in the cross. I, I know he had been told to talk more into the microphone, but he was he had got louder and more animated and very... Um, uh, you know, any time he was challenged and told he was a liar, he was quick to say, oh, I'm not lying and this is why. You know, he was very passionate about answering quickly and he got a bit irate towards the end because he didn't, there were one or two times where he said, I don't know why you're asking me this. Why are you asking me this? And I don't know where you're leading me with this. And and, and as I'll get to, as a, at a portion at the end, Brendan Graham kind of just let him talk. And we were all kind of sitting there like, is he going to stop him at any point? And I, I remember Brendan Graham said to him, um, is that it? Is that all of it now, or are you finished? Kind of, you know, and it, like, I supp- I don't know whether that's a tactic or what, but he, I mean, he got to the point where he kind of just let Jonathan Dowdall rant, and he really was just ranting uh, at that point about nothing really that's pertinent to the case against Mister Hutch, but uh, a lot of stuff about his uh, treatment in prison and things that have allegedly happened to him in prison, and about his health and his health conditions uh, and all of that. I mean, he really went on a long tangent at the end but we'll come back to that if we have time so mr grehan uh it would be fair to say that he opened up with a one two he basically called him a liar twice there was no soft soap and he, he went for the jugular shall we say yeah so as you said he hit him with the one two um he said there were two big lies that you gave as part of your testimony he said to jonathan dowdall one is that jared hutch collected the hotel security cards from you and your dad and the second is that he confessed to you in a park a number of days later. Uh, so he hit him with that straight away. He called him a liar from really the get-go. Um, he said that Jonathan Dowdall was kind of portraying himself as a good Samaritan, so to speak, and that he stepped in uh, to get involved in the feud and to help Patsy Hutch uh, to mediate um, and to give some sort of solution. And Dowdall said, look, I was asked to stop. I was asked to mediate the feud. Uh, and Brendan Graham kind of immediately kind of cut in. And so your solution to that was to go to the IRA, uh, get get them involved. Is that right? Um, and he's I doubt I was like, well, you look, you know, I couldn't go to the cops. I uh, didn't go to the Gardaí, you know, so I could, I was asked to help. I was asked to mediate um, again. He brought up like, I think this is important to state this. He said he didn't really know anybody. So 
he's asked to go and talk and mediate uh, and speak to people in the IRA or in a dissident background, but then he's also saying, I didn't really know anyone. Um, but uh, again, that was challenged later. You know, well, if he didn't really know anyone, then what was the story? But he said, I knew someone that could talk to someone that might, you know, arrange a meeting that could then bring about a, a mediation and end to the feud. But he was sort of kind of trying to say, I didn't, well, admittedly, I didn't really know anybody. Just so, one quick question, Paul. Yeah. Did he, did he, and we spoke about this yesterday about distant IRA against versus IRA. Did he give any clarity on which IRA he was contacting? No, he didn't. As I said yesterday, he said that he wasn't talking about the anyone in the provisional world. Uh, the way he described them was dissident. That's the way he describes uh, the individuals that he was talking about. There were people named uh, in relation to Shane Roan, who was Fish, uh, and another individual that was called Kevin Tyrone, who was the person they were really trying to meet. Um, but Jonathan Dowdall... Excuse me. Jonathan Dowdall had... Um, two meetings up north where he was trying to meet this Kevin Tyrone character, but the Kevin Tyrone person never showed up. Um, I, again, I propose to come to that in, in a second, but just going in, Mr. Graham was just initially asking him about, you know, why did they, why did they trust you? Why did they come to you of all people? Why Jonathan Dowdall of all people? And he said, I believe even at one point that Patrick Hutch Jr. stayed in your house, that Patsy Hutch asked you to, to put him up when, the, when his life was in danger. And, and then we got into the Joe Duffy stuff, which I thought was particularly interesting. It got very animated from here on out and there was kind of sniggering in court. And, you know, yeah, Mr. Gretton has the one liners, you know, so people couldn't help but react it was a bit, I, I don't want to say it was like a show, but like he'd say something and then people in the courtroom would react because it was just so, so staggering. So he, he said, well, you know, Mr. Dowdall, you asserted to the people of Ireland at the time that you had no involvement in crime. Isn't that right? Um, and, and, and Dowdall responded, oh, well, are you talking about Joe Duffy? And he said, yeah, I, I, I am. I'm talking about Joe Duffy. And straight away, Jonathan Dowdall wanted to talk about he, how he was on the, on, on the show at that point in time. So the context there is it was around the 9th of March 2016 when the Garda Special Detective Unit searched Jonathan Dowdall's home on the Cabra Road in Dublin uh, and that was part of this investigation and so that was the day that the Kalashnikovs were found it was the same night we've spoken about this how we got the story purely by chance when I heard about the search but anyway um, the following day uh, Mr Dowdall went on Joe Duffy to, to talk to Joan to talk to the nation Basically to say, it's not, uh, there's, there's nothing here, nothing to see here, move along now. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, that was, we really went into that in terms of, you know, why were you talking about this and what was your mindset? And, and Jonathan Dowdle said, well, I was upside down at the time. I was taking tablets every day and he wasn't in the right mindset when he spoke to Joe Duffy. My home was being searched at the time, he said, and he thought it might have something to do with the regions he incidents as to the reason why his home uh, was being searched um, but he said you know I wasn't lying when I was on Joe, Joe Duffy when I, when, he, when I said that I wasn't involved in organised crime well, so Mr Gretton said well were you involved then in disorganised crime so to speak so this is a reference to uh, the fact that by this point in time Jonathan Dowdall had waterboarded, uh, tortured and, and held a man hostage in his own home. This individual was Alexander Hurley uh, I don't propose to talk about this too much, but just in summary, John Tendelda went to prison over this, initially got 12 years, and then on appeal, his his sentence was reduced. Um, so John Tendelda, you know, kind of went into this a little bit and said, well, I put, I advertised a bike on Dundeal, uh, and then this individual came over, and he believed he was a barrister, and he said that this person then tried to defraud him, and he, he said, oh, I deep, but I deeply regret what happened. He said it shouldn't have happened, and he's sorry over it. And he did his time in prison, he said, and I, I, he went to psychologists and, and he received help in relation to it. Um, but Mr. Grehan wanted to challenge him on the fact that he pleaded guilty to that crime. Um, and he said, well, you did, didn't you half plead? Didn't you half plead guilty? He said, what do you mean by half plead? You don't half plead to something. And Mr. Grehan said, no, you don't. But after you went through the process of pleading guilty, going through the sentence, you then challenged that and, and you wanted to take issue with things that Alexander Hurley had said. 
in his appeal, uh, basically, uh, of his conviction. And and John Dodell kind of got a bit, this is kind of a roundabout where he got quite animated because he wanted to challenge, uh, he wanted to challenge his conviction, he said, and he went to the Court of Appeal over that and he said, we won three and a half out of five points, he said. He said, what do you mean by three and a half out of five points? Um, you meant out of the five points in the appeal, he felt that he'd won three and a half of the arguments. So he said, we effectively won that hearing. Um, so Mr. Graham kind of brought it back then. He said, well, look, I'm diverting a little bit. Um, I started off by asking you about your relationship with the truth. And he said, do you accept that you lied when you went on the Joe Duffy show and you talked about that your house was being searched and that you had no involvement in crime, in criminality? Um, that was a lie, was it not? He said. And he said, well, no, I, I wasn't involved in organised crime. Uh, and then Mr. Grattan still pushed him, well, how about criminality? He said, well, look, I had committed a criminal act. Um, but, you know, Mr. Grattan pushed him again because at this point in time, no one, no member of the public uh, knew uh, about the fact that Jonathan Dowdall had waterboarded a man because only in that guard search that the guards found a USB key. And when they looked on that USB key, there was a video because this incident... Jonathan Dowdell had got somebody uh, to film uh, the process of of Mr. Hurley being waterboarded in his home. So he had the crime on tape and the cops only discovered it because of the fact that they searched the home. Um, So Mr. Graham kind of put it to Jonathan Dowdell. Well, you didn't discuss it on the radio because nobody knew about it at that point and you didn't want anybody to know about it and you didn't expect anybody to ever find out about it again. You didn't think it would ever, ever be discovered. but Jonathan Dowdell kind of responded by saying, oh, but it was. It was discovered. It did come out. He said, well, then that's not the point. You didn't want anybody to know about it and you didn't expect anybody to ever find out about it. So he was trying to put it to him that you're lying when you say you were never involved in crime. Well, you quite clearly were because you 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 waterboarded a man in your house, essentially. So throughout this, he continued to label him a liar and to give to assert to his reasons why, well, here is why you are a liar. And how did, uh, in your mind, how did uh, Mr. Dowdle stand up to this really As forensic, I, said, I suppose, questioning? Yeah, I think he got quite agitated. Um, but, you know, I, I suppose anybody, when you're being accused of being a liar, you, you, you probably would react, uh, you know, if you felt that you weren't. Um, and he certainly got quite agitated and quite lively at this point. This is a different sort of... Um, uh, sort of reactions out of Jonathan Dowdall than how we had seen him maybe yesterday or earlier today. Um, as I said, we could go on about the search of the home and, and the waterboarding innocent, but uh, incident, sorry. Um, but I think we'll just move on slightly. Yeah, so we moved on um, and I'll, I'll come back to, to certain things just as I think of them because there's so much, but I just want to uh, give people the highlights, so to speak. Um, Brandon Graham was asking uh, Jonathan Dowdall about getting the AK-47s moved. Um, he had contacted these associates up in the north and and Brennan Graham put it to him that you basically contacted these people to get the AK-47s moved. That was denied by Jonathan Dowdell. He jumped straight in. He said, I wasn't involved in moving the AK-47s. But he said, well, he was told by Jerry Hutch, he said, um, that these individuals were given them. But as I said earlier, he claimed he wasn't in the room. He was out of the room for 20 minutes. So Brennan Graham said to him, well, did you have any contact with these guns at all? Uh, and he said, no, I, I never did. Uh, when I contacted these people, it was to stop the feud and it was before the Regency. Um, and he felt at that point in time that he was kind of boxed in and that he was in the middle of it now. And he had no choice but to continue on. Uh, you know, he had been further contacted by the Hutches and asked to help and go up north with Jerry Hutch. But by this point, he was very stressed and he was on tablets, as he said, and he wasn't himself during this particular time period. Um so again, I I think this is inter- This just kind of garnered laughs from all of us because we spent a bit of time talking about this meeting between Jerry Hutch, the individuals up north, uh, and if you remember from a couple of weeks back in the case when we were shown surveillance photographs of Jerry Hutch, Jonathan Dowdall, and another individual meeting Shane Roan in his house up in Donegal. And these, the members of the National Surveillance Unit were there and they were watching, uh, unbeknownst to John Dowdell or Jerry Hutch, and they took photos of them. And there was mention of this hold-all bag 
uh, I don't know if you remember that at the time, that there's a photo of Jonathan Dowdall with a hold all bag taking it out of the boot of the Land Cruiser. Um, so Brennan Gretchen asked him, well, what was in this what was in this kind of toolbox? Uh, what was in this? Was it tools or was it a, a, a um, you know, where you're going in to fix a plug? And kind of straight away, John Tadero said, yeah, that's what I was doing. And he was going in to fix a plug. Going in to fix a plug. And there was sort of a gasp in the, like everyone just went, huh? Well, and, and even Brendan Gretton kind of looked stunned at this point. You know, he's trying to eviscerate, I suppose, certain responses and certain answers. Obviously, he is challenging the witness and he's, he's expecting a bit of a, um, a fight back. But I don't, I think he was like stumped by that because as he went on to explain, he was just kind of messing, so to speak. He was sort of just, you know, I said it because it was of the ridiculousness of it, really. Like, I mean, what did you, what did you, th- what could we think you were doing going in to fix a plug? He was kind of joking, but Jonathan Dowdall insisted, no, that's exactly what he was doing. He was going into Shane Roan's um, house, I believe it was, and that he was going to fix a TV plug that there had been some sort of electrical fault and earthing issue. And that's what he was in there to do. But Brennan Graham challenged him on that. Well, you know, you're on the tape, on the secretly recorded tape talking about uh essentially making a bomb wiring a bomb um and that as someone with an electrical background he could find you know it would make sense that people of a republican dissident background might be interested in jonathan dowdall's ability to make a bomb because there's discussion again on this tape i don't know if you remember mick of placing a bomb under a member of the Kinahan cartel's shed. So there was a, per, a, a member of the Kinahan cartel who was living in a shed at the time. And uh, Hutch and Dowdall are talking on the tape about possibly placing a, an explosive device um, under this individual's home. Um, so Brennan Gretchen is suggesting that maybe these, dis- you know, I could see how these individuals would be interested in your ability to, you know, electrically wire something like that. Uh, and Dowdall wasn't he wasn't taking that. He was like, I don't see how that follows suit. You know, I didn't ha- I don't know how to 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 do any of that. Um, so you say, oh, you didn't you didn't know how to do any of that. Well, then why are you saying it? Um, and he's kind of saying, well, I was asked. I was asked, would I be able to do um, a, you know, a circuit and that? But I I didn't know how to. And he he said, well, you had said that you can YouTube this, so you can find out about it on the internet. And Dowdall was denying all of this. No, I I I never was. I had never had any intention of doing anything like that. And he stuck to his position, which was the reason he brought that hold all bag in, um, was simply just uh, to to fix this plug. And Mr. Graham pointed to the ridiculousness. You're telling us, you're telling this court, telling the country, that you went with Jerry Hutch of all people in the height of the feud from Dublin to Donegal to fix a plug. And Mr. Dowdall said, no, that yeah, I mean, that's what I was there for. That's one hell of a call out fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, in relation to, you know, uh, the circuits and, 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 and uh, you know, Mr. Dowdall said that the circuits he refers to on the tape, they didn't exist. So, again, here's Mr. Gretton calling him a liar. So it was all lies then, he's saying. Uh, and Mr. Dowdall, is, at this point in time, said, well, yes, of course, it was all lies. Um. So it's an interesting quote from Brennan Graham because I think this is his whole uh, case. He said, how do we know which Jonathan Dowdall is speaking? Is it the liar or is it the person who claims he's telling the truth, he said. And there was, I think that's one of the lines that actually kind of eviscerated a bit of laughter and a bit of kind of, oh, in the room, you know, like turning into a little bit of a show. Uh, Jonathan how did quite, Dowdall react to that? He was stressed through that and he said, I'm not a liar. I don't have any reason to lie. Why would I lie? And I mean, uh, later we had discussion in relation to, you know, wouldn't it be convenient for you, Mr. Dowdall, to change uh, names in the case? Because he said throughout this, you have made allegations and it's all Patsy Hutch. It's Patsy, Patsy, Patsy the whole way through, he says. And then out of nowhere, in the last minute, you throw Jerry Hutch into the mix. Suddenly Jerry Hutch has this very key involvement. But he, he said it kind of would be convenient to you, especially when you were facing a murder charge, which at that point, you know, at the point in time, he's making these allegations about the meetup with Jerry Hutch and the confession supposedly by Jerry Hutch. Jonathan Dowdle was staring down the barrel of a murder charge himself. And Brendan Grattan put it to him that it isn't effectively convenient 
that you're now bringing Jerry Hutch into the mix, that you could swap Patsy out for Jerry. And Dowdall got a bit irate about this. He said, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't name somebody. I wouldn't... I wouldn't incriminate somebody unless, you know, they were involved. And he said that he would not swap out Patsy Hutch for Jerry Hutch. So, example, there was the meeting, allegedly, between Jonathan Dowdall, his father, and Jerry Hutch on the 4th of February, the day before the Regency, where he said his father handed over the key card for the hotel room to Jerry Hutch. And that key card, he said, sorry, he said they didn't have any conversation, and that was that. Mr. Graham was putting it to him that, well, that could have been Patsy. No, he was saying he was insistent upon that was Jared Hutch. And he put it to him that I would put it to you that those two incidents and the incident in the park where you say you had this conversation, that you made it all up, that it didn't happen. Conversation never happened. He said, after all, why would Jerry Hutch talk to you? I mean, you were never friends. You weren't friends. You didn't know Jerry Hutch. Um, OK, fair enough. He had a sort of a background uh, with the Hutch family and he had a friendship with Patsy but he said you didn't know Jerry Hutch you know if he, if the on the on the occasion on the 4th of February Jerry Hutch had no conversation with you you're then trying to make us believe he said that when you met him in the park days after the Regency that he was spilling his guts so to speak that he was telling you everything why would he tell you of all people when he didn't even engage in conversation with you the previous time so how are we supposed to believe that basically he was trying to say but Jonathan Dowd kind of bit back a little bit and said, well, I did know Jerry Hutch. I grew up around Jerry Hutch. I would have known Jared, would have seen him through the boxing club and he knows his family members. So, and he said he was agitated that day after all the Regency had just happened and he needed help. And that's why he came to him. And that's why he said what he said. But Keith, that he did also say, that's the only time where Jerry Hutch ever told him uh, that he had shot David Byrne. He didn't tell him that ever again in any other further conversations he had with Jerry Hutch, he said. There's an awful lot in this. What's next? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a very easy job here, Haley. Uh, I, I mean, next. there's so much. I mean, then uh, Jerry, uh, sorry, Jonathan Dowdall was asked, you know, well, you didn't come forward to the Guardi until quite late with all of this pertinent information in relation to Jerry Hutch, and why not? And Jonathan Dowdall was trying to say, well, I, I tried to. I, there, as, I just think this is one interesting aspect, possibly to me and you, maybe not to members of the public, but I'll talk about it briefly, that he brought up a, a Twitter account and he said a Twitter account was being controlled by them. Uh, and he said that this Twitter account had targeted uh, Detective Superintendent Paul Scott. Uh, he said as a result of that, he felt that he could trust uh, Mr. Scott and through his own solicitor he said he attempted to contact the Guardi at that point in time didn't really get into why that he, he didn't uh, end up talking to the guards but just maybe yeah, briefly talk about that Twitter yeah, account so, or maybe we be just slightly yeah, no, cautious so about I, it, but yeah. I, I, Firstly uh, Paul Scott was the senior investigation officer investigating officer for the, the murder uh, at the Regency Airport Hotel so uh, there was a, a, a my memory is that account became active or became aware, we became aware of it in our minds uh, around April 2021 uh, after the, there was a, a revelation that there had been a European arrest warrant issued for Mr. for Jared Hutch, who we know was in Spain at the time. And if it is the account that I'm thinking of, it's probably the one you're accounted of. It was, it was, it was, it was going on about Paul Scott. He was the superintendent at the time. He's now retired. Um, and it 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 hawked him. It really did. It really did go after him. And it look as we we've said this before. One of the features of the Ken and Hutch feud has been the use of social media. When one of the Ken Hens did, and I don't know who ran this account. Jodel is saying it was the them, which I presume is the Hutch side. But yeah, so that I, I certainly remember it really going after uh, Superintendent Scott there. Yeah, and I mean. Uh, just on that then, you know, Mr. Grehan was challenging Jonathan Dowdall on why did you didn't come forward. Why didn't you come forward in 2018, 19, 20, 21? And Jonathan Dowdall said, well, I couldn't come forward after 2018 because I was in prison. Um, And he felt that if anybody was attempting to contact him in prison, be it Gardaí visiting him, that anybody would know about it. So he felt, he, he felt uh, concerned for his safety and his wife and his family's safety. And he said he put that in before anybody else. He didn't, he, he, I wasn't going to put my family's life in danger for and anybody. I, I seem to recall when, um, I think it was 
Detective Sergeant Patrick O'Toole was given evidence about talking to Dowdall. It was a, effectively, it was a hush hush operation. And my memory is they arranged to meet him in the uh, guard station at Dublin Airport. And there was a back door exit. So it, there was a bit of hush hushness, if that's a word, to that whole operation to talk to Mr. Dowdall. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to circle back a bit. I hope it doesn't confuse people, but just I was speaking about, um, you know, Jonathan Dowdall's involvement in trying to stop the feud, allegedly, and to mediate. And Mr. Graham really challenged him on this um, because he said, you know, I'm still at a loss. I, I can't understand why he called it the Northern Command of the IRA. Can't understand why they would get involved in this. Why would they get involved with this? And, and why you? Why Jonathan Dowdall? You know, why couldn't the Hutches and the Kinnahan sort this out themselves? Um, and Jonathan Dowdall basically said, look, I was asked to broker some sort of agreement uh, and, uh, between the two groups. And he went to these people for that. And just a good quote from Brendan Graham, he said, well, since when have the IRA got involved in the mediation business? <laughs> Which, again, garnered some laughs uh, in, in the courtroom. Um, I think John Tadell kind of has turned a bit on the hutches because he said at that point in time, I was speaking to a man who was supposed to be innocent, he said, and he's referring to Patsy Hutch uh, to try and help stop the feud. Um, and he said, well, why did Patsy come to you? I mean, you you don't contact, uh, not anyone could just contact the IRA. You don't exactly get them through the yellow pages. Um, you know, again, Jonathan Dowdall felt that the Hutches were innocent people, that innocent people were being targeted. Uh, um, but during all of this, for example, on the 4th of February, he says that he was up north trying to meet this Kevin Tyrone character, although Kevin Tyrone never met him. And that was the 4th of February. And at that point in time, he says, I didn't know at that point in time, the Hutches were planning the Regency. Um, I didn't know that that was going on. Uh, in spite of the fact that on the journey home, his father, Patrick, received a phone call from Patsy Hutch asking him, have you booked that hotel room yet? Um, you know, he says, look, me and my father, we, we booked the hotel room if we had known uh, who was going to stay in that hotel room we wouldn't have done it and he says it wasn't until they were speaking to the Gardaí that they actually learned that it was Kevin Murray flat cap that was in the room he said never knew who was going to be in the room at all uh, and that they had booked rooms for Patsy previously um, you know over the years they just didn't know who was involved he, at several different points in time he said I wasn't involved in the Regency I wasn't involved in the murder of David Byrne it's important to remember that he pleaded guilty to facilitating the murder of David Byrne. Uh, and several times today he said he wasn't involved at all in any aspect of it, other than booking the room, and he was very clear to say that they never knew what the purpose of the room was for or who was even going to be in the room. Um, so this is a man who's pleaded guilty to an offence, but he very much feels he's innocent of, uh, of the crime, so to speak, in relation to the murder of Jerry Hutch, sorry, of the murder of David Byrne. And, and Mr. Graham, you know, he wanted to labour on that point that you were facing a murder charge. And that is why you spoke to Gardy and said the things you said. Um, and I doubt I'll really fought back on that point. This wasn't about him trying to get a charge dropped. He was basically trying to tell the story as it was. And he said he would have come forward uh, sooner. And he just didn't have the opportunity to do so. Yeah, I just I'll finish with the, I'll just finish this with this point because again this kind of stunned us that in relation to Jonathan Dowdall's father, uh, you know he, he Mr. Graham was like, oh, well, your father hasn't come here to support you. He hasn't made any statement. Why is that? I mean, you're saying you met with Jerry Hutch and your father was there. How come he hasn't come to back you up? And Jonathan Dowdall got very annoyed by this because he was like, well, you didn't call him. Why didn't you call him? He said to Brendan Graham. Why hasn't the prosecution called him? Why hasn't the, uh, sorry, the DPP called him? The judges? He said, my father is willing to talk. He's willing to testify before the court if he's asked. Um, but Mr. Gretton, look, he moved on from that. But Jonathan Dowdall was really at pains to say that his father was willing to testify before the special criminal court and to back up his claims um, that they did meet Jerry Hutch and pass over the, the key cards uh, for the, uh, the key card for the Regency Hotel Room. No, we plen- don't see the witness list, so yeah. it, who knows? It could happen. We don't have a clue. But anyway, look, there, there's it certainly there's, hasn't been called to we, date. Yeah. So, uh, how did it end? Because uh, there was a huge amount in there. So, what was the last scene, shall we say? 
it, as I said, it ended with a, a, a big long rant by Jonathan Dowdall that we that Mr. Grattan kind of more or less let him talk. We got a little bit of an insight into the complaints that he supposedly made, the long list of complaints, although Jonathan Dowdall said it wasn't a list of complaints. Um, apparently, on last Friday, Jonathan Dowdall went to the governor of Limerick Prison and complained uh, in relation to the fact that he hadn't received medication in a number of weeks and that he has a spasm, uh, serious spasms uh, and is- health issues. And um, Mr. Graham put it to him that he was trying to leverage the fact that he was going to give evidence this week and that he needed he was trying to get his prison um, situation sorted and his health issues and medication issues sorted. And he was leveraging the fact that he was about to give evidence to do that. And John Tedero said, well, you know, I've, I've had to travel two and a half hours from Limerick prison, you know, and I'm, I don't have my medication and he's in pain, apparently, and he has this health condition. Um, but he said, regardless of your complaint, I, I'm here. I'm here, am I? I'm giving evidence. So he was kind of saying all of that was a moot point because he was here now and he was being cross-examined nonetheless. So we more or less left it around then um, after a kind of a long spiel by Jonathan Dowdall. Um, there was other stuff in relation to an alleged incident that happened uh, where someone alleged that they had been kind of assaulted or attacked in some way by Jonathan Dowdall and... Mr. Dowdall denied that, said it didn't happen, and it and there was it was investigated by the Gardaí, and they found out that it was nonsense. Um, that's more or less where we left it. So there is a rake more, I'd say, to go. But it was very interesting throughout the day. Mr. Grattan repeatedly made the point that you're a liar. How can we trust anything you say? Here are all the you know examples as to why you're a liar. Um, really, really fascinating stuff, a uh, blockbuster stuff, and I'm sure there'll be more tomorrow. Brilliant, and I really look forward to it. And I think we'll. I'll speak to the editor about getting a special medal minted for you for all your hard work today because that's a that's a tough game. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Paul. Thanks very okay, much. Okay, thank you.